Great. So this is our workshop on leaky gut. We do this every year. However, when I did it last year in 2019, I actually broke it up into two different classes that were each an hour long. And in the first class, we had a chef come and teach us some tricks and tips. She's great. Her name is Laura Fox. So at the end of the presentation today, I'm going to give her your uh, give you her contact info in case you need some help with meal planning and prepping. I also, during the second hour, had our herbalist, Rachel Zingone, come on and help. And she talked a lot about gut healing herbs, a lot about the Ayurvedic perspective to cooling down the gut if there's fire or giving it more fire if it's too cool. I'll explain a little bit of that if we have time at the end, but just know that there's always more to learn. This is meant to just be a basis so that that way you understand the full picture of gut healing and that way you also kind of know what to ask if you, um, when you come in the clinic, um, you can bring up certain tests and certain things with me if we haven't gotten there yet. A lot of times one-on-one, -on -one, we're doing things in a stepwise approach, and so we wanna get there as quickly as possible. So just a friendly reminder to always check back in if you haven't been seen lately and you have some questions or concerns. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. First I have to. All right. And then I'm gonna to try to start my slideshow here. Great, okay. So I can't see the chat very well while I'm going through this, but feel free to jot down questions or put them in the chat and we will check them at the end. Okay, so I left all my annoying credentials because I just wanted to mention that yes, I'm a physician assistant, but I'm also a lactation consultant and a yoga teacher. And the reason I bring both of those up is because when we teach people how to breastfeed and we support them, then we have a lot more babies and one and two year olds that have really healthy guts. So I'm passionate about healing people's guts, guts um, not just because of because I've seen the autoimmune disease and the leaky gut that's very prevalent in our community, but also because I see a lot of parents that aren't given support to help breastfeed. They know it's healthy, but to be quite honest, they don't have the tools to be able to sustain breastfeeding. And I think that first of all, it's free, right? And second of all, it's one of the best ways to lay the foundation for health. And this is not just what I think, it's the whole functional medicine integrative community, right? And even the conventional medicine agree, right? But that doesn't mean that they always set you up to have the best breastfeeding um, sort of journey, especially if you have a baby with a tongue tie. And that's actually where it comes, where, where the yoga teacher training comes in. So one of the most important things in yoga is activating the parasympathetic hormones and calming down the fight or flight. This is essential to healing the gut. Why? Because a lot of times the vagus nerve, which is the biggest nerve in the body and runs from the back of the tongue all the way down to the tailbone or the pelvis, when it doesn't have enough tone or when you're too stressed and you're stuck in fight or flight, essentially what happens is you don't digest your food. And babies that also have a tongue tie can also have issues with the tone of the vagus nerve. So this is a big deal because um, there are adults walking around with tongue ties where the frenulum that connects under their tongue is too short and they're not able to allow their tongue to rest in the roof of their mouth, which is the most comfortable resting position because it activates the calm, the, the rest and digest hormones. They're also not able to swallow properly and they're mouth breathers. And so my yoga teacher training really taught me how to recognize these people but if you breathe in your, you know, only in and out of your mouth and not out of your nose, especially all night when you're sleeping, you end up with a lot of um, adrenal issues and a lot of gut issues. So I just wanted to bring that up. And I'll get back to defining what some of that means in just a second. Okay, my presentation is frozen. There we go. So um, we know that functional medicine begins with gut healing. 
It's the root cause of all disease. And we need to make sure that we are eliminating or doing the best that we can to lower all of these things on the slide, right? So trying to get toxins out of our environment, trying to lower our exposure to allergens, which my allergens may be very different than yours. Although having said that, everyone I've tested here lately is allergic to grass and allergic to cockroaches. So we know those two things are probably high on most people's list. Um, microbes so um, certain especially things like lyme disease or hiv or retroviruses can cause inflammation in the gut and if you think about it the immune system and the lymph system is actually surrounding the intestine 80 percent of it so any sort of infection can actually cause inflammation in the intestine and when i say gut i'm really talking about the large and the small intestine and then, of course, stress can cause gut issues. And a good example to that would be before you go take a test or if you have a job interview and you feel your stomach flip. And that's literally a direct way that anxiety or stress is causing your, um, you to feel nauseous or you to not be able to digest your food well. So there is a gut-brain connection. This is well documented. We understand this now. And then also poor diet. So we call the standard American diet sad. I think a lot of you already know that. Um, but what it means is that it's way too high in carbs and too low usually in leafy greens and cruciferous vegetables. And oftentimes it's also um, too high in corn syrup, right? So carbs, corn syrup, sugar, things like breads, right? Okay. So this is what I'm going to try to get through, and I realize it's a lot. Again, we did it in two hour chunk, a two hour chunk last year. However, I'm going to I'm going to gloss over some of it and stress more other parts. But we want to talk about what leaky gut is. Talk to you about some of these different types of diets, and what are they, and why do they work for certain people? Just so you're familiar with terms, if you start to look things up on the internet, what does leaky gut look like? How does it cause autoimmune? Um, how can we actually figure out if we're eating a food that we're reacting to? And that's a big question because it's very likely that we are eating at least one food that we're reacting to, right? Um, and then IgG testing is one way that we can do blood testing to see what foods are reacting to. So I'm going to talk about the positives and the negatives. Zonulin, I'm going to talk just briefly that zonulin is something we can measure to confirm that you have leaky gut. To be quite honest, I don't really use it much anymore simply because everybody that I meet has leaky gut, so I don't really need to test for it. <laughs> I know that sounds awful, but it's true. Um, how do we heal is very important. So I want to focus on how do we heal and what should we eat? What about digestive enzymes, probiotics, candida? What is SIBO? Um, you know, why can it be so depressing to go on elimination diets and then lists of local resources? And I will give you Rachel's info so you guys can also email her about herbs for the gut. Okay, so I like this picture because it just kind of shows you what you're, if you could see through the person's skin, this is what you're looking at in terms of their intestine. Um, and that picture is actually the large intestine. So keep in mind that the small intestine is about 23 feet long and it's all coiled up. And the large intestine is actually shorter, but it is wider than the small intestine. And it's about five feet long. So I want to stress throughout this talk how important it is that you poop every day. And we don't talk about this enough in our society. I don't know why, but it's just something we don't talk about. Um, I actually was very concerned years ago when I was in a mom's group and someone mentioned that their baby didn't poop for two weeks and other people responded with, this is pretty normal, that's happened to us. So that's very, very alarming to hear of a kid, especially not pooping for two weeks. Why? Because the longer that the stool sits in the intestine, the more likely you are to reabsorb the toxins from the stool and have them recirculate. So every single day we gotta poop to get rid of the toxins. I mean, that is literally the point of your poop is to get rid of the toxins, right? 
And then I like this photo just because this is kind of, this is what you can see on a colonoscopy of a patient. Um, we know that the lining of the gut, unlike the skin, which is eight cell layers, the lining of the gut is only one cell layer thick. This is a problem because if you get a break in the cell layer, that's it. That was your barrier, right? So for example, something like gluten um, forms, when you digest it, it forms a protein called gliadin. And every time gliadin is produced, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I know I'm gonna say that thing that nobody wants me to say, but every time gliadin is produced, it causes inflammation in the gut. And that causes a break in this one cell layer. So just like shingles on a roof, they're supposed to be overlapping. And as soon as the, the shingles have a break in them, then this is a problem because now whole food particles are actually getting through the lining of the intestine into the bloodstream. And that's not what we want. We want everything to stay in the intestine and be digested and have only the good vitamins absorbed. We don't want to absorb, you know, whole proteins and toxins because this is when we start to affect the immune system in a negative way and develop things like chronic fatigue, etc. So um, let's see. I don't think I have any other thoughts there. Let me go on to the next one. These are two awesome books on leaky gut. Um, leaky gut is a term that's been around for quite a while now. Eat Dirt is one of my favorite books to recommend to patients because he does, Dr. Josh Axe does a really good job of breaking it down. Why um, has the hypothesis hygiene, which basically means um, hand sanitizers and overcleaning and antibiotics. Why has all of this ruined our good gut flora? And then this book on the right, Heal Your Leaky Gut, actually talks more about these specific diagnoses. Like if you have type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease, or lupus, or you have, you know, GERD or acid reflux, he's talking specifically about um, how you can heal to prevent these diseases either from getting worse or completely reverse them altogether. And I especially see this with allergies. You know, I have to be totally honest, seasonal allergies are a result of leaky gut and they are much worse for a lot of patients right now in the last two weeks than they were a year ago. And I think you guys can probably figure out the reason why is the amount of stress that people have been under. So I'm not surprised when I was in, you know, started clinic this morning that everybody I saw was experiencing some form of allergies and it's because their gut is not as healthy as it was a year ago, unfortunately. So some people are like, this is the first time I've ever had fall allergies, but that's what's happening is that you're not able to keep the pollen that you should be clearing in the stool and it's triggering more histamines to be produced than should be produced, which we'll talk about in a few slides about histamines. So those are my favorite books. I wanted to talk for just a minute about this debate. You know, everybody's always debating different diets. I think that combinations of different diets work for different people during different times of their life and during different times of their hormonal cycle. So it's very hard for me to jump on a bandwagon for one specific diet. Having said that, we know that in order to heal your gut, you have to focus on cooked foods, not raw, and you have to focus on things like bone broths and very high nutrient density foods. Because when you have leaky gut, you are not completely digesting and completely absorbing all of the nutrients from your food, which means you're not absorbing all the healthy fats, you're not absorbing all the proteins, and you're not absorbing all of the micronutrients like zinc and copper either. So um, it's not really about ascribing to one specific diet, but I did want to summarize what each one was just in case you're not familiar with them, and I won't spend too much time on this. But vegan is completely plant-based, no animal products whatsoever. Um, the only issues I see with people, I shouldn't say the only issues, but sometimes I see with vegan that people need to plan their meals very carefully so they get enough protein and they need to focus on eating more vegetables believe it or not a lot of vegan 
patients are just addicted to carbs. They're not actually eating enough vegetables. Um, sometimes we always have to add B12. Sometimes we also have to add omega-3 supplements for vegan patients. Paleo is, you know, in general, if I have to pick one, it's usually my favorite just because it's, I think the most, the closest to the way that we eat if we let children actually just choose how to eat. A lot of kids do not prefer the breads and the carbs and the foods that slow them down physically and mentally. They actually really like the vegetables and, and the turkey and even, even seafood. Um, so I've seen a lot of kids go from, you know, nursing to eating basically paleo just because they were their parent was following their lead and just supplying them with more of the food that they really wanted. So that's been my observation just based on like doing breastfeeding circles and things like that. Um, I also think it's sometimes the best way to get all your vitamins from your food, but not always. I also wanted to show you a little bit about FODMAPs. So FODMAP is a specific diet, which is an elimination diet. And some patients decide to take out FODMAP foods. And what that means is that they've taken out fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. So they've taken out sugars. These are very specific sugars that they've taken out. Um, and sometimes they can have a very small amount, like an eighth of an avocado, but not an entire avocado, simply because of the sugar content. But the reason why people are doing this is because they've gotten to a place where they feel much better if they don't feed the bad or the, or the harmful bacteria and the harmful yeast. However, the FODMAT diet is very um, difficult to adhere to. It's very isolating because there's a lot of things you can't have. And in my opinion, what we'd be better served is actually preventing people from ever, ever needing to get to that place um, by making sure that we don't kill all their good gut flora to begin with. Because it's almost like there's, there's two armies going on in your intestine. You have really beneficial flora and harmful flora. And if you can get, keep the, the beneficial flora at a high number and keep the harmful flora down, then you don't need to worry about what you're feeding with what you're eating. So um, there are a few reasons why people have to go on this diet. It can help temporarily, but it's not a long-term answer, right? Okay, it has definitely been in some medical journals. This is a little bit more about what it is. Certainly it takes out sweeteners and sodas and crackers and cakes and things like that. GAPS is a little bit different. This is called gut and psychology syndrome diet. So one of the most important things about the GAPS diet is that it includes really healthy fats that your body can absorb. So there's a there's some fermented dairy. So there is some dairy allowed. There is vegetables, but they are well cooked. There's bone broth, lots of meat stocks and soups. Um, and then usually patients use taking the GAPS diet, which a lot of them are doing it more for mental health. Um, and also, in, they also take vitamin A, digestive enzymes, maybe vitamin E and D. Um, amino acids. So the goal is to actually help make enough serotonin in the brain that you make enough happy hormone. And we know that there are serotonin receptors as well as dopamine receptors in the gut. We know that the intestine is talking to the brain constantly to encourage it to make more happy hormone or the opposite. Um, and the problem with getting patients off of medications for depression or getting patients off of medication for mood, like bipolar, mood instability, is that we really have to heal their gut first and the medication itself, the pharmaceutical, also causes leaky gut. So we're in a, a bit of a conundrum as we wean someone off of a psychiatric medication and use food in its place. It takes a long time. So this is the one thing I want people to be prepared about if they are taking a medication for mood that usually takes a long time to get enough healthy fats, get enough good proteins and a, enough good leafy greens and cooked veggies that they can come off of their medication. I could do a whole talk just on the gut-brain connection. Um, Kelly Brogan has really great resources, and she also has a book that you can download, um, 
eat for your mood, and that's a free ebook. Okay, and then the ketogenic diet is, you know, I mean, it's somewhat controversial, especially in the program I'm doing for, for the Institute for Functional Medicine, simply because we don't have as many studies. Um, some people do something like they take the ketogenic diet and they make it the carnivore diet. And I don't recommend that at all, simply because we know that vegetables are anti-cancer, anti-autoimmune foods. And I'm trying to prevent autoimmune disease and prevent cancer in all of my patients. So I recommend if someone wants to go keto, which I personally did keto for a long time, that they focus on eating enough vegetables and then use meats for their protein, but that they don't go down to zero carbs. There are a lot of people that are eating no carbs and it's really, especially for women that have their period, it's really not healthy. It actually increases their stress hormone because their body's really stressed out by this. So People sometimes do okay for two, three months and then they crash and that's why, because they can't go, they really shouldn't go to zero carbs. Sometimes a hundred grams of carbs would be a much better choice and they can pick a couple days a month when they do less or when they fast. So, uh, but that's what, basically you burn ketones instead of burning sugar and there are people that are athletes, that are runners, that actually burn ketones or fat instead of sugar and they they do fine we don't have enough long-term studies for me in the clinic to recommend this type of diet but if someone comes in and they're already on it then i'm and they feel good then i'm okay with continuing it as long as i see that they're eating enough leafy greens and enough cruciferous vegetables okay um, foods that are high in histamine would include alcohol for sure especially wine champagne beer um, sauerkraut, vinegar, soy sauce, yogurt, kombucha, um, pickles, mayonnaise, olives. Sometimes when people are already having a high histamine response to their environment, for example, if they live in a place with mold, then their histamine bucket is full. And what happens is they feel okay. Their histamine bucket is like 99% full. And then they have the food with all the soy sauce on it. And then they have a histamine response. They get really sleepy. They get red. They have, you know, they get teary. They um, are just beyond tired, joint pain, brain fog. So signs of leaky gut and signs of high histamine can sort of mimic each other to some extent, especially with the joint pain and the brain fog. But I'm bringing it up just because I wanted you to know that especially this time of year when a lot of people are having allergies, some people are, are overfilling their histamine bucket when they eat a high histamine diet. The problem is a lot of the foods on this list are really good for us. So we don't wanna take them out forever. We actually wanna to get to the root cause of histamines, look at cryptopyroles, which are in the urine, look at whole blood histamine, um, figure out how to lower histamines in a healthy way or at the same time take an antihistamine and then we can begin to add things back into the diet. Sometimes people also just get diarrhea when they have a high histamine reaction. Okay, Hippocrates said all disease begins in the gut. I think that we all understand this now, but it we did fight an uphill battle for a long time to get everyone to recognize that, right? Okay, and so I just wanted to mention real quick that Lyme disease is very tricky because it can look like um, gut inflammation, especially people that have been to a bunch of different GI specialists and nobody knows what's going on with their gut. And it's actually just that the spirochetes are so tiny, they're hiding in the lymph nodes and hiding in the gut. Oops. Um, sometimes it is like the chicken and the egg. Did you get leaky gut because of exposure to gl gluten over a lifetime? Or did your leaky gut come from hand sanitizers, in infant formula, or BPA, or antibiotics? And eventually that led to your gluten in in sensitivity, your gluten sensitivity. Um, and I, you know, I also think that gluten sensitivity and celiac are very, very prevalent and they're underdiagnosed. I mean, I've seen many, many, many times where someone really thought that they didn't have many GI symptoms at all, but they did have brain fog or fatigue or a rash or hormone issues. And when they took out gluten, all of it went away. So I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. We know that leaky gut can also cause autoimmune disease. 
Um, it can lead to irritable bowel disease, but irritable bowel disease is its own classification of autoimmune. It includes Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Um, can it, we, we think it's linked to autism for sure. Um, you know, but again, it's the chicken and the egg. Did they have autism before they got leaky gut or did leaky gut actually cause autism? Well, certainly there's high levels of toxins and, and heavy metals in children with autism that could have caused the leaky gut, right? Anything that could trigger inflammation can cause leaky gut. Asthma um, can be caused by leaky gut for sure. Um, food allergies or sensitivities can cause leaky gut and be caused by it. Eczema, you know, I often say to patients that the skin is the um, window to the gut. So when I'm looking at their skin in the clinic, I can tell them how healthy their gut is. Just because, you know, things like psoriasis or eczema, that means we need to work on gut healing. And then, of course, higher chance for developing diabetes if you have leaky gut. So I think we have enough reasons to tackle it now. And I just wanted to, to comment on how it causes autoimmune disease. So if you can see on the right, this is a list of all different autoimmune diseases that I see every day, alopecia, multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto's, diabetes, hepatitis, psoriatic arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. So all of these can be very different and attack totally different systems. But what happens in autoimmune is that your own cells are attacking yourself. And so um, what, the reason that that's happened is because, like I mentioned before, whole proteins have gone through the lining of the gut, and now the bloodstream comes in direct contact with whole food proteins. The immune system attacks these proteins as foreign invaders. However, after t over time, the immune system is hyperactive from attacking these proteins every meal, three times a day, and now it essentially starts to attack its own cells. So there are two ways that this happens that I also mentioned later. One is called molecular mimicry, and the other is called the bystander effect. And what I just described is more like bystander effect, where essentially the immune system's going haywire, and oh, by the way, there's the thyroid and all the bloodstream that's passing by the thyroid is like, yeah, I'm really just going to start attacking everything, right? So not good because we don't want our body to attack itself. So this is a little bit more about what, what I just said, especially that first bullet point. Um, and then the second bullet point just talks about triggering a high rise in inflammation. So before you get autoimmune disease, you usually have chronic inflammation. And most people with autoimmune disease also still have chronic inflammation. So we are always trying to address inflammation, right? Um, and then there I, I mentioned both bystander effect and molecular mimicry. So you can Google those. You can also let me know if you want me to send out the slides. I'm happy to do that. I'm just going to take one second to make sure that nobody else popped on that I missed. Ah, there we go. Okay, I got Jen back in. Okay, so that is what I had to say about autoimmune. Next, gluten can, uh, can cause autoimmune disease. So the first way is because gluten triggers the release of zonulin, and zonulin is bad. It is a chemical that tells the gut lining to open up and allows more of the big protein particles to pass through that lining. It's supposed to be like a garden hose where it's solid and instead you end up with a sieve that has holes in it and that's not helpful. Second, gluten's also inflammatory. So it stresses your immune system. And then third, it also can cause molecular mimicry. So gluten has a certain um, amino acid in it that looks similar to the amino acid structure of the thyroid. And it looks similar to Epstein-Barr virus. And so what ends up happening is that people that have had Epstein-Barr or have ingested large, amount, large amounts of gluten, they eventually develop thyroid antibodies. Toxins. So toxic molds, as well as heavy metals, these are the most common things I see, also cause autoimmune disease. Um, I don't think I need to go in too much more detail, but suffice to say that these tiny, tiny, tiny toxins, which molds, mold toxins are tiny and heavy metals are tiny, like mercury is tiny, it's very, very hard for the gut 
to continue to get them out into the stool unless we have binders like charcoal or clay or something called G-Pure or zeolite that actually binds to these toxins and gets them out in, into the stool. What we do not ever, ever want to do with someone with toxins, which all of us have them, is give them IV chelation that will stir up the toxins and allow it to sit there instead of using oral binders that get the toxins into the stool. So a lot of people need to take binders every day for at least a year before we see improvement. It's not a quick turnaround, but at the same time, it's very much worth it. Um, okay, and then infections. We also, I already kind of mentioned on, you mentioned Epstein-Barr, herpes simplex 1 and 2, E. coli. These have all been linked to cause autoimmune disease um, in a couple different ways, but I just wanted to put it out there that I'm seeing post-COVID syndrome. So I'm seeing patients that had COVID and now they have what looks like autoimmune disease from COVID, right? It's not all of my patients by any stretch, but it is some people. And I think we're gonna see that more and more and more, but it's not necessarily different than what I've already been seeing with um, post-Epstein-Barr syndrome or post-herpes post syndrome. There are so many billions of viruses in the world that can cause autoimmune disease. My concern is more that we're able to live in, um, you know, harmony with all of the viruses in the world. So not that we need to like take a machine gun and kill them all, but we need to recognize that they're there and know how to support our immune system correctly. Okay, and then we know that stress disrupt, disrupts the immune system. Um, we know that chronic stress leads to long-term inflammation, okay? So I'm not going to go into too much detail because we're going to talk about this. If you come to the workshop in October, we're going to talk all about stress and the nervous system. Celiac disease. My favorite book is called Peter, is by Peter Green, and it's called Celiac Disease. Um, and I want to point out that there are patients that will travel to Italy or France or somewhere where they have really good wheat that's not high in gluten, that has not been sprayed and genetically modified, and they do fine eating wheat there. So we've, we've ruined our gluten crop here in the United States, and even organic wheat because of the way it's grown in these fields where it blows, they still find Roundup, which is the pesticide that contains glyphosate in organic wheat fields. And that's a problem because we know that glyphosate causes leaky gut. So it would be great if it was completely banned from this country, but until then, do what you can to read and learn and educate yourself. Okay, this is where I wanted to kind of focus for a minute about IgG testing. So there's different parts of our immune system that react to everything. IgE reaction to a food looks like anaphylaxis or hives or I can't breathe, right? But IgG reaction to a food can just look like chronic fatigue, brain fog, maybe rashes, maybe joint pain. Um, sometimes people feel some reflux. Sometimes people feel, I'm trying to think of, I recently was tested and of course it came back positive for eggs and coffee, two of my favorite things. But I was able to take them out and I survived. <clears throat> and my goal is to heal so that a year from now I can eat those again. Um, but yeah, so IgG reaction is a chronic thing. I noticed I was reacting to eggs because the day after I ate eggs, I was really tired. It wasn't that obvious though, because at a meal, you don't just eat one food, right? You eat a lot of different foods. So I preferred to do my blood work, but it is expensive. Usually it's about $290, $300 for the cheapest panels. Um, Dunwoody Labs does a good panel, so does Genova, and Larissa and I are going to look more into the Genova panel and see if it's actually worth running on people. It's a little bit less expensive to do a smaller panel. So um, these are the things that we, we could test for, um, so just some of the things. And okay, let me go to the next one because I'm going to get back to what things are most commonly found positive on these tests. Fortunately, most people are not allergic to coffee like me. <laughs> okay, elimination, the best test. So it's also very affordable to take things out that you know could be causing a problem 
and eat the things that you know aren't. But it's very difficult though sometimes for some people to tell what's actually not causing a problem, right? So I always recommend people work with a provider. It doesn't have to be me, but sometimes a health coach is better at this. Work with a health coach who actually knows how to make sure you get all of your nutrients while you take foods out. Um, a couple I can recommend at the end, um, Ludi Dementin is actually really great with elimination diets. She's my favorite. She's in Carrie, but she'll do Zoom. She does the autoimmune protocol diet. Um, she's very good with helping people make sure they get enough food, enough nutrients while they eliminate all the foods that they might be aller allergic to. Okay, and then also look at your poop. There should not be undigested food in your poop. You should use a squatty potty because it actually puts the colon in, it straightens out the colon so that you can actually completely eliminate your waste. Um, if you're not using a squatty potty and your feet are dangling, you're really not able to completely eliminate your colon. If people are opening the door on you and you don't have privacy, you know, I know what that's like because I'm a mom. Um, if you are in a hurry and you haven't given yourself enough time, especially in the morning to poop. That's not great either, right? I learned a lot about how important it is that we poop every day when I saw a paraplegic patient in the hospital. When I was working infectious disease in the hospital, I went to go see him and I asked him, how did he know every day when he had to poop? Because he was living on his own, doing everything by himself, and he was amazing. And he said to me, oh, I get a little bit of pressure in the front of my forehead. And I thought that was awesome because I noticed that I do feel that myself. I get a little pressure right here before I have to poop, but it's hard to notice it if you're not really tuned into your, your body, right? But that was his thing. It's not true for everybody, but it was his thing that he was really, really in tune with his body so he could get to the toilet in time. I thought that was really cool. Okay, then I wanna talk for a moment about parasites. So parasites are prevalent and everybody has parasites, but a lot of people are fine with living with these friends and they're fine and we don't need to analyze it. However, when you start to have symptoms, one of the things I look for is actually not a parasite, it's an opportunistic infection called candida, right? So candida is your typical yeast infection, like women get it vaginally or under their breasts. It is supposed to be there in small amounts and during times of stress or times when we overuse caffeine or our, our diet is too high in carbs um, or we're not sleeping well, a lot of times can the candida um, grows too high and the good flora that's supposed to continue to fight the candida is too low. And so it's more actually the balance as opposed to killing all the candida. Having said that, there's a time and a place when we really need to kill some candida, especially when people's tongue is white, when they're trying to swallow and they're having pain swallowing, which is something I went through a few weeks ago and it's not fun. It's awful. Every time you swallow, it just hurts because there's candida in the esophagus. Um, and so these are some of the best herbs to fight candida. We also sometimes use nystatin or fluconazole. Make sure that we don't feed the candida. So take out sugars, take out um, basically sugars and dairy that would be feeding the candida. So I just wanted to put this out there because a lot of times people go straight to the pharmaceuticals, but sometimes there's a benefit to using the herbs, especially if it's more of a mild thing. Because of our high stress lifestyle, a lot of people need to do a candida cleanse for a couple weeks every year, and they feel much better, especially with brain fog. Okay, I already mentioned bone broth, but technically it's basically this really thick, um, you know, stock. So you can use chicken or you can use beef or you can even use pork or pig's feet, but it should be high in gelatin so that when it cools, it actually almost becomes gelatinous. It's obviously not helpful for vegans because they won't eat it, but it's, it's, it helps line the inside of the gut with calcium and zinc that we really need for the gut to heal. So you can drink bone broth once a day and be confident that you're healing your leaky gut. Now, store-bought bone broth is actually high in histamine, so you have to be careful if you're not tolerating histamines. Kachari is also really great for gut healing. It's just mung beans and rice and different um, spices, turmeric and, and ginger. These are some of my favorite things to use for gut healing. Butyric acid or ghee, um, glutamate or um, L-glutamine, 
digestive enzymes um, to just make sure you're digesting all the way, probiotics and prebiotics, quercetin, phosphatidylserine, or just work on the adrenals, which can really help you digest, aloe, marshmallow, and slippery elm. And I do also like combination products like GI Synergy, Enterovite, GI Repair, GI Revive. These are all great because they combine a bunch of different things all in one so you don't have to remember to take everything separately. Enterovite is actually butyric acid, vitamin E, and then A and D can also really help with gut healing. So those are some of my favorite things to use for fixing the problem. And then what should you eliminate? Well, I think a lot of you know this, but in general, I've already talked about gluten. We know that the protein in cow's milk called A1 casein can trigger a very similar immune reaction to gluten. I wish I could get everybody to take casein out of their diet, but it really does bind to the opiate receptors. So you go through a physical withdrawal when you take it out. Some people can tolerate goats goat's casein or goat's protein much better than cow. And some people can, can tolerate camel's milk or use camel's milk powdered in their smoothies. And that's really great for gut healing. We know that sugar feeds yeast, feeds bad bacteria. Um, I find that local or raw honey is the best option. Sometimes agave is fine, but even some of the fake sweeteners can actually feed the bad bacteria. Um, unsprouted grains, um, and these can actually contain phytic acid. So sprouted grains would be much better. We do need, you know, I mean, I'm not really someone who says you have to take all grains out because grains do contain B vitamins, but some people temporarily do need to take all grains out. And then um, anything that's been genetically modified, which has destroyed the probiotics in your gut. Okay, and then it continues here. We already talked about bone broth. Um, some people can do raw cultured dairy. This is more of a Weston A. Price foundation idea, but some people can't. Some people could do something like a goat's milk yogurt. They would tolerate that much better to re-inoculate the gut with good bacteria. Some people can also do kimchi, coconut um, kefir, things like this. These are high in histamine. However, if you're Finding other ways to lower your histamine and you're tolerating histamine, they can help to lower the pH and actually balance the intestine um, and the stomach and the intestine. Then we also know that steamed vegetables, not raw, are very healing to the gut. And of course, healthy fats. I think you guys live in the modern world where we've been learning a ton about how great these healthy fats are for us, right? Um, I would add, you know, chia seeds, flax seeds and olive oil to this list that's not on there. Okay, and then this is a little bit more about what we've talked about. I already mentioned everything on here except the aloe vera and the fish oil. It doesn't mean that you should take everything all at once. However, some people need to rotate some of these items. Some people need to start with just aloe, like just drink two ounces of aloe vera juice twice a day and just start somewhere. It's affordable, it's easy to remember, it's not taking a pill. I find that sometimes that's the easiest place to start. Um, fish oil can also be helpful because it, it helps with multiple different complaints, not just leaky gut. So. Visual, you have to be careful though. You wanna find a good quality one that does not contain heavy metals. I don't know if you can read this because it's so tiny, but this is just my way of saying there's lots of vegetables, lots of roots um, that are healing to the gut that we don't even think about. Um, I mean, when's the last time you cooked a pumpkin and just ate a pumpkin as your carb for the day? Maybe you guys did because you're very healthy here, but... Um, turnips, water chestnuts. I mean, I just encourage people to open up cookbooks, especially like vegan cookbooks where they're just telling you how to make vegetables and use those to learn how to cook vegetables. The, the biggest mistake we make is that we overcook our vegetables and then they don't taste like anything or we forget to season them. Okay, we know that there's between 100 billion to 1,000 billion <laughs> beneficial bacteria per million. It is really impossible to take a probiotic and, and expect that to somehow permanently shift your gut bacteria. 
I don't want to discourage you from taking a probiotic, but that is a really expensive way to try to fix the gut. The more affordable way is, well, to never have killed all the good gut flora to, to begin with, right? But also to use prebiotics instead. Um, or focus on gut testing where we can actually grow what's in your intestines and then I can tell you exactly what you need. Um, I know it's expensive. Gut um, stool cultures are usually between like $250 and $400. But if you do it one time and then the rest of the year you buy the probiotics you need, then you may actually save some money, you know. Um, okay. I'm not going to go into too much detail. This is just a, a photo to show you what it looks like with all the bugs living in us. Okay, and then what kills our good bacteria? We know drugs, antibiotics, obviously, um, ibuprofen. So just today, I talked to patients, I talked to three different patients. They were eating raw foods that were not easily digestible, that were killing their gut flora. They were unaware of food allergies that were causing fatigue as opposed to causing like nausea or diarrhea. Taking ibuprofen, um, had a tongue tie, taking synthetic hormones, and then also eating a very low prebiotic diet. And by prebiotic, I actually mean all of the foods and the soluble fibers we need to eat to feed the good gut bacteria. Um, okay. I don't think I'm going to go into too much detail. I think everybody is probably kind of aware that chlorine kills our beneficial bacteria. This is why we should not be drinking tap water. Um, so I like using Genova, the comprehensive stool analysis, to, to um, actually grow out whatever's going on in your stool. It's not that reliable though. It's it's not, the test could be better. So what we're trying to develop is actually a better test where we can test the DNA of the bacteria so that even if it's dead when it gets to the lab, it doesn't matter. It's fine. We can tell what bacteria is there. So for a little while, Ubiome was doing it, but I think they stopped. But let me know if you, if you have questions about other kind of fringe labs doing stool cultures. The tricky thing is that you have to collect poop. So some people don't like doing this, but to be quite honest, if we could get a good stool analysis done every year, it would help us prevent a long list of comorbidities like high blood pressure and diabetes and all the autoimmune diseases and even cancers. So it is, if there's any way of doing it, um, you know, two to four hundred dollars it's worth it it's just tricky it's because right now obviously a lot of people are under financial stress so um and then SIBO testing to be honest i use small intestinal bacterial overgrowth i use a questionnaire now i don't do a lot of testing because it is expensive and if you have all of the symptoms of SIBO but your test comes back negative i'm going to treat you for it anyway and i'll talk about more in a minute what it is Okay, so it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Normally the small intestine is more sterile and the large intestine is where all of the bacteria is. In SIBO, you have too much of the wrong bacteria that's migrated up into the small intestine. Sometimes constipation alone is what has caused this. So yes, we do need bacteria in our, in our intestine, but we don't want as much to be in the small intestine. We want the large intestine to be the house for the bacteria. These are some of the symptoms, gas, bloating, stomach pain, diarrhea, weight loss, fatigue, nausea, nutrient deficiencies. People with SIBO often tell me, I swallow a sip of water and it makes me bloated, right? Um, it's been caused by low amounts of stomach acid, which can be caused by antacid medic medicines, especially Prevacid and all those over-the-counter antacid medications. It can also be caused by an improper um, gallbladder. So a lot of patients with mold exposure, their gallbladder is not working well to kick out bile, and that means they're really not digesting their fats, and that can cause SIBO. Um, constipation or a very slow-moving intestinal tract can cause it because the bacteria back up from the large intestine back to the small intestine again. And then the lining of the digestive tract can also be a problem for SIBO and normal valves. So, so the last point here about structurally normal valves, um, 
means that a chiropractic adjustment or even you yourself finding the spot between your belly button and your right hip where the ileocecal valve is, you can actually find it and you can very, very slowly push deeper and deeper and deeper. And if you can completely reduce that valve, you can often get the food to move. And a lot of people, if they do this to lay down before they go to bed at night, it helps to keep everything moving so that they have a bowel movement in the morning. So that's just a little trick, but ask your provider before you go adjusting yourself. So this is not supposed to be blurry. This is your um, example of the results when we do a stool test. Everything in yellow, you don't need to read it, but just know that everything in yellow is commensal or kind of like, we're not sure if it's great, but it's definitely shouldn't be so much of that there. And then dysbiotic or bad bacteria is in red. So it's really amount about how much good do you have, how much kind of intermediate and how much bad. And this person has some work to do because we want to see nothing really in this red column and everything over here in this green column. And then also we did check for candida and the patient was positive for too much candida. Okay, I'm going to kind of zoom through because we are out of time. I don't know that spore-based spore, spore -based probiotics are better. Are they better for some people? Yes, but it's, it's really, the point of functional medicine is it's individualized. I cannot tell you without talking to you and evaluating you and examining you if spore-based spore biotics is, are best for you. Um, they, the probiotic industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Every company wants you to think their probiotic in, is the best. It's, it's very tricky because if you walk into a Whole Foods nowadays, there's actually zero probiotics that I would recommend there. In fact, there's almost no supplements I would recommend for probiotics at this point because they've, they've gone with things that are being marketed well, but not necessarily the best for, for the consumer. Okay, ideas about how do we recolonize the gut, meaning how do we get good bacteria back in there if we've killed it with, say, antibiotics over our lifetime? So I've already mentioned how expensive probiotics are and they don't really last. They work while you're taking them, but they don't continue to colonize the gut. There is this brand called Thrive that you can go to their website and they say that they are testing your stool and then they're sending you a probiotic that is curated for you. And I'm a little bit weary of this because if they're doing the testing, then of course they're going to find something wrong because they're trying to sell you their product. So I don't think the science is there yet, although I would love for it to be there. Um, the Probiotic Advisor is a great website to go check and see. Like if you're having depression right now, you can go to Probiotic Advisor and you can type in depression and it will tell you which strain of bacteria you should be taking to help you make good, happy hormones. Um, I also wanted to mention real quick stool transplant. It's not that weird of an idea to think that somebody with really healthy bacteria in their gut could donate some to you. They've got plenty. They're pooping it out every day and flushing it in the toilet. Um, they're doing this in the Bahamas. They're also doing this here in the United States for people with C. diff which is a specific type of bacteria that takes over. So they're already doing it, but they're not doing it for the reasons that I would do it in terms of preventing autoimmune disease, preventing hypertension, preventing diabetes. So we're not there yet, but we're close. There's also a clinic in Charlotte where they'll teach you how to do it yourself if you can find a donor. You wanna find someone that has really healthy poop and then you wanna test their poop and make sure it's good. Um, it's cheap if you can find some way to do it kind of off the books. Anyway, prebiotics are actually more effective at, oops, and that's supposed to be soluble fiber with an S, sorry, not coluble. But prebiotics are basically all the soluble fibers in the foods we eat, things like leeks, asparagus, sunchokes, onions, garlic, chicory. How many of these can you get in a week? Can you get 40? servings of prebiotic foods in a week. I mean, I'm challenging you to try to get more prebiotics in your diet. It is challenging to do it all at once though. You wanna slowly build up so you don't feel gassy because you're, you're feeding all the bacteria. So you will feel gassy if you go from zero to a hundred all in one week. And then these are some supplements. Biotogen contains um, arabinogalactin and beta-glucan and inulin, and all of these are great prebiotics that are over-the-counter that are less expensive than probiotics, and they work better long-term. 
So if you can tolerate them and you don't get gassy, that's the way to go. Some people need to take both though, right? Um, okay, I think that's it that I wanna talk about. Um, this is just a comment that our second brain, which is our gut, has become weak. It's due to the fast-paced lifestyle of today's humans. Diets are consisting of sugars, artificial colorings, hormone-filled fried foods. It's not a good situation. Um, the more you can learn about this and tell people about it, the better off we will be in the future. Um, and that's from Thrive, where they actually do that curated probiotic, which I'm not necessarily endorsing. Um, and this is what we're going to talk about next time. So I'm not going to go through these slides because we'll talk about them next time. Your brain and your nervous system is directly connected to your gut. I already mentioned that feeling you get when you're nervous, when you're really not hungry, you're just kind of nauseous. We know that our emotions affect our gut, right? Think about what you do when someone dies and you bring them food to comfort them, right? We, we know this, um, but I wanna go into more detail about the nervous system and how we can help heal our nervous systems as a society. And I'm gonna talk more about the vagus nerve in October. Um, this is just an example of what's contained in, di in a good digestive enzyme. It will have everything, like all of the different enzymes. This does not have HCL, which some people also need, and it does not have ox bile, which some people also need to take if their gallbladder is not working. So this is a good digestive enzyme, but it does not contain everything that you might need if you're really not digesting your food. And then this is just local resources, and I can send this list out separately in an email. It's basically just telling you places locally where you know you can find food that's not GMO, that's not sprayed, um, it is really worth it to get food that's higher quality and eat less of it. Um, unless you're someone who's already not eating enough, in which case we'll talk. <laughs> um, and so, for example, like I went to the Durham Co-op the other day. I didn't have as much of a choice in terms of which produce I got. I also went to the farmer's market this week, but I knew that I was actually saving money because I was buying food that was in season, that was not sprayed. And some of it is less expensive because it's local. They didn't have to ship it, you know? Here's more. Um, Western Wake Farmer's Market is great. You know, the farmer's markets are open. You know, you go in, you kind of enter, there's a hand washing station, wear a mask, and you go out the opposite way, and everything's sort of pre-bagged for you, so you're not touching stuff. But I think it's great to get back out there and get back to the farmer's markets if you can. There's also a lot of farms that will deliver to you now because of COVID. Um, okay. That's it, I'm gonna end my screen share, but I can go back to any slides since I went so fast. If you guys have questions, it's 7.01. Um, there's no stupid question. I'm gonna end the recording though.